But this question of fear, we're all afraid of it. And there are things in relationship to this fear that you and I have to recognize, that if you trust in God and let him be your guide and strength, you won't have that fear. And your fear is in relationship to your trust. As your faith in God gets stronger, your fear dissipates. And as your faith in God gets weaker, your fear arises. You want to have fear dissipated and removed, then you rise up and hold up the name of the living God and look to him to undertake for you, and he will. It's our faith that brings victory. It's our faith that casts out fear and enables us to put our trust in the blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will worship the man of Galilee who went to a cross 2,000 years ago. And no one can take his place. No one will intercede or interfere. We will not permit it. And so it is we have faith without fear. All right, good morning, church. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. I feel, feel like I need to give maybe three different welcomes because we've got a few people who are in the service right now helping put on this live stream. So welcome to everyone who's here. Welcome to our families who are out on the lawn. You guys want to give like a round of applause so that the live stream can hear you? Maybe you heard that, maybe not. And then welcome to those who are watching from home. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm the youth pastor here at Beach Bible, and I am so thankful to have the opportunity of sharing from God's Word this morning. If you've been following along from the past several weeks, you know that we've started a new series in the book of Esther titled Faith in the Face of Fear. Before we go any further, I'd love to just open up this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as we look to your Word this morning, may we be changed by it. Father, may we open our hearts, open our ears to what your word has to say, and, and may it not fall on, on deaf ears, God. Lord, we love you, and we just want you to be glorified above anyone or anything else this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. So I wanted to start with a question, and the question is, have you ever been placed in a situation where you needed to make a stance for your faith? Have you ever been placed in a situation where you needed to make a stance for your faith? So I want you to think about that exact situation. And, and as you're thinking about that situation, I want to give a few different examples that may or may not be relevant to you. For those who may work in a secular environment, maybe there's a time where you've been faced with a moral dilemma. Your company might be cutting some corners, and it seems like your boss is on board with it. It seems like the coworkers are. And you're placed with this decision of, do I stand for what is right, or do I just give in with what everyone else says that we should do? For our students, there's, man, there's this constant battle of their faith in God and fitting in with others. I know it full well, and, and to be honest, there's times where I even feel that today. But to give a specific example, maybe a, a student is invited to a house party, right? And they know internally it, it compromises their convictions and their beliefs, but at the same time, they want to fit in, they want to be liked, they want to be accepted, maybe even seen as popular. So they struggle with that decision, I think about social media, oh my goodness, think about all that we've seen on Facebook, on Instagram, just scrolling through your newsfeed. it's not hard to find an argument. And it makes you wonder, how should you respond? Do you maybe comment or, or post something and risk facing scrutiny from others? Or do you just keep scrolling, almost ignore it, pretend like you don't see it? You see, regardless of what the situation might be, there's a common thing or feeling leading up to each of these decisions, and that is fear. There's a fear of judgment. There's a fear of backlash. There's a fear of stirring the pot. There's a fear of being seen as different. There's a fear of sparking controversy. And what we're going to see this morning 
is in our passage, there's one man who made a stance in the face of fear. And it led to some pretty gnarly circumstances. And even though uh, Esther was written thousands of years ago, this story carries the same principle that applies to us this morning. If I could sum up this message in just one statement, it would be this. Make a stand for Jesus, even if you're the only one standing. Make a stand for Jesus, even if you're the only one standing. And from what we know of the book of Esther, I want to bring up two things before we go any further. The first is this. As Mike has mentioned in previous weeks, God's name is never mentioned in this book. And so some may read it on the surface and think, is God absent? Is God really there? But in the midst of what seems like God's absence, he is still working. And secondly, when all hope seems lost, when circumstances may seem bleak, God is using every decision, whether that's fueled by pure intentions or evil intentions, ultimately to accomplish his will and his plans. Our God is sovereign, which means that nothing is outside of his influence and nothing is outside of his authority. So with that being said, I'd love to dive into the text. We're going to be reading from Esther chapter 3. How it's going to work, I'm going to kind of break it up into different segments, talk about it a little bit further, and then we're just going to go through the entire text. And so let's start with verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. So let's stop there because we're introduced to this new character named Haman. And all that we know of Haman so far is that he was promoted to the highest position by the king. Think of it as like a second in command. And you see, the author's placement of Haman's promotion, it seems a little bit out of place. If you remember from last week, as Mike wrapped up the end of chapter 2, you'll remember that it was Mordecai who uncovered this assassination plot against the king, ended up notifying Esther who told the king, and it saved his life. So if you're following along with this narrative, you'd assume if anyone were to be promoted... It would be Mordecai, but instead, it's Haman. I want to pause and and even ask the question, has there ever been a time in your life where you weren't properly recognized for something that you maybe deserved to be recognized for? Or better yet, maybe someone else was recognized for something that you did. If I'm being honest, this is probably my least favorite feeling in the entire world. And I don't know if that reveals more or less about me, but the first thing that also came to my mind was group projects, right? I'm not too removed from school, and so I remember having my fair share of experiences with group projects. But the thing about group projects is this. There's typically one person who takes on the biggest load of work, right? There's that one person in a group of slackers who's taken on all the work, and they just want to make sure that your group gets a good grade. And the thing is with group projects is that everyone, for the most part, does get the same grade. And so there's that incentive of, if I'm in a group with slackers, i got to make sure I step up, right? Take one for the team. But getting back to the point, we can just agree this isn't a fun feeling, Even if you did all the work for the group project, you may not be recognized for that or maybe given an extra sort of award. So what we've seen is Haman is promoted to a high position by the king. But what we're going to see more is what that entails. So let's go back and read in verse 2. It says, And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So what we've seen so far, Haman's promoted by the king. And what's followed with that promotion is this sort of commands that whenever Haman passes by, that all of the king's servants must bow down and honor Haman. I mean, talk about feeding someone's ego, right? From what we'll see in this chapter, 
Haman, he's a very arrogant and prideful man. So he's probably relishing in the fact that whenever he's walking around the capital, that he's got people bowing down to him. He's loving it. But there's one person that chose not to bow down, and that's Mordecai. In fact, he refused to do so even when he was prompted or, or even nudged by the king's servants. I want you to picture this scene where Haman is passing by and all the king's servants are bowing down to him. And it's like they look over their shoulder and see Mordecai still standing thinking, Mordecai, what are you doing, man? Did you see Haman just walked by? Like, do you know what we're supposed to do here? But it says, Mordecai refused to comply. He didn't give in. Day after day, after being warned by the king's servants, Mordecai stood his ground. And remember, we don't really know the motives behind Mordecai's refusal. Since it's a narrative, we can only read the story and then sort of imply what the motivations are. And we have to kind of read in between the lines. So from what we know of Mordecai, he doesn't seem like he's one to stir the pot. In chapter 2, he asked Esther to conceal her Jewish heritage. If anything, this shows he's quite passive. Even shows maybe he's wrestling with some fear. It also seems that Haman wasn't even aware of Mordecai's perceived disobedience. It wasn't until the king's servants notified Haman that Haman reacted. And so what this tells us is that as Mordecai is standing amidst all the king's servants bowing down before Haman, it's not like he's got this megaphone saying, hey, Haman, look at me, I'm standing, right? You see, I'm standing amidst everyone else bowing down. He's not making this outwardly act of defiance. It's not obvious. He's not making a spectacle out of himself. So with this in mind, what do we think are some reasons why Mordecai chose not to bow? Could it be pride? As we saw earlier, um, it doesn't seem like Mordecai is a rebellious person, but maybe he was trying to get a point across. Or maybe it's jealousy. Was Mordecai's refusal fueled by envy because Haman was promoted to a position that was meant for him? You see, neither of these explanations align with Mordecai's character or from what we've read about him so far. There has to be a more reasonable explanation. And if we go back into the text, specifically in verse 4, we may be able to find what that explanation is. It says, And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. There it is. I'd say arguably the most probable reason why Mordecai refused to bow down is because he was a Jew. It compromised his beliefs. As a Jew, Mordecai didn't want to bow down to anyone or anything apart from God. And we can assume that Mordecai was alone in this decision. In the text, it doesn't mention anyone else who chose to remain standing as everyone else was bowing down. And we still know that in Susa, there had to have been other Jews who were present who maybe they did bow down, maybe they didn't. But from what we can read in this text is that Mordecai, he stood in boldness, whether that was for God or or for whatever other reason. And it was in the face of fear And he was the only one who was standing. And we can't say again with absolute certainty that this is 100% the reason why Mordecai didn't bow down to Haman. All that we know is he made a stance. He made a stance that was unpopular. He made a stance that was bound to spark some controversy. And it couldn't have been easy for him. And maybe it was the very first time in Mordecai's life where he took a stance of boldness and courage. As I'm sure that many of us would agree, it is so much easier to blend in with a crowd than it is to stand out and be different. Because standing out can be controversial. 
Standing out means that people might question you. They may doubt you, they may mock you, or they may completely abandon you. Major League Baseball started just a few weeks ago, and I can't tell you, church, how excited I was to see baseball again. Oh, it was so nice, even though no one was in the stadiums, just to see baseball. And whether or not you follow baseball, there's one story that made headlines, and again, it sparked a lot of controversy. On opening day, before the Dodgers and Giants game started, quick side note, I'm from the Bay Area, which means I'm a diehard Giants fan. I know there might be some Dodgers fan in the church, but just thought I'd let that know as a precursor. Um, before the Dodgers and Giants game started, there was a moment where every player and coach from both teams, they took a knee and they held this long piece of black fabric in a moment of unity. And it was uh, in response to the injustice that we've seen with our black brothers and sisters, but also in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so all players, all coaches participated in this, all except for one player. And the outlier was San Francisco Giants pitcher named Sam Coonrod. He chose to remain standing during this time. And in an interview following the game, Coonrod had this to say about his decision not to kneel. He says, I met no, will, no ill will by it. I don't think I'm better than anyone. I'm a Christian. I just can't kneel before anything besides God, Jesus Christ. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of difference in opinion with Coonrod's decision, even between believers. It brought up these questions like, is it wrong to kneel or to pledge or to bow down to anything or anyone apart from God? Or is there a difference between showing respect and worshiping? So wherever you feel on the spectrum, and I hope that there's one thing that we can see in his example and, and, and just come to an agreement on. And that is that this player, he, he felt some sort of conviction from the Holy Spirit. He responded to that and made a stance for Jesus Christ. And he was literally the only one who was standing. Not everyone agreed with his decision. I, I mean, I've read articles of, of people bashing him, questioning him, calling him insensitive, hatred. I'm sure he's still questioned and mocked to this day. And that's because making a stance for our faith, it's not always easy. And oftentimes, we're met with various challenges. If we go back to where we left off in chapter 3, we'll see that Mordecai was met with a pretty big challenge in response to his decision. Starting in verse 5 and going into verse 6, it says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, as they made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. See, Mordecai's decision to stand, not to bow down to Haman, it set this whole wicked plan into motion. And it makes me think of times where you know, you may be so upset with someone or something, and, and you may have this sort of uh, knee-jerk or impulse reaction. And oftentimes that's fueled with anger and frustration. I mean, granted, I'm sure we've all had a weak moment or two, right? But Haman, he takes this to a whole nother level. <laughs> Haman was filled with rage and anger towards Mordecai, all for the fact that this man didn't bow down to him didn't feed his ego, didn't show him the respect that he was clearly seeking. And he was so filled with wrath that, that it wouldn't be satisfied by just killing Mordecai alone. He found out who Mordecai's people were and then began devising this evil plan to not only wipe out Mordecai, but to kill all of his people, the Jews. Man, talk about an overreaction, right? Right? This gives us a lot more information about who this character of Haman is. Prideful, angry, filled with wrath. 
And as we're reading this text, like this is around the time in the text, the story, where you may question, God, where are you? God, where, where are you in all of this? Think of how many times in your life where you may have asked that same question. You want to believe that God is present and working in your life, but he just seems absent. You're being faithful, you're going to church, you're serving, you're in a life group, but life just isn't working out as you would have expected. Maybe you're seeing the wicked prosper like Haman, and and you're seeing the righteous overlooked like Mordecai. And all these things lead you to question, God, are you even there? You know, I wonder if Mordecai felt this way too. I wonder if Mordecai was was talking with God and saying, God, why didn't you honor my stance? God, did you see I was the only one who was standing? God, do you know how challenging that was for me? Or God, how could you allow Haman to kill our people? Aren't we your chosen people? Don't you have a plan for us? You see, even though God seems absent in this text we can rest assured knowing that he is still working. Sometimes we think this needs to be by miraculous means or these stories of healings or something that's obvious that we can see with our own eyes right in front of us. But that's not always how God works. Often God works through what seems to us like coincidental or chance events. And these sort of coincidental or chance events are often formed from our own human decisions. Whether that be from evil or questionable motives. But all of these things are part of God's greater plan. And he's still using all of the uh, gnarly things that have happened in this story. He's using it for a greater plan that he has in store. So now that Haman has his eyes set on destroying the Jews, he begins to piece his plan together. In verse 7, it says, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So phase one of Haman's evil plan is to set a date for the massacre of the Jews. He chose to rely on Pur, which is also known as Lot. And casting lots was this practice used to leave a decision up to chance. It's like the modern day version of flipping a coin or rolling dice. And keep in mind, the Persian religious system, they stressed fate and chance. And Haman, he was an incredibly superstitious man. He chose to cast lots to sort of leave the the date up to his gods. And so the casting of the lot determined the Jews would be killed on the 12th month, which was still 11 months away. And church, this is even a sign of God's clear providence. There were still 11 months till this so-called massacre were to come to fruition. It reminds me of this verse in Proverbs 16.33, which says, The law is cast into the lap, but it's every decision from the Lord. This date, it didn't come from the discretion of any gods. This date was picked under the direction of our one true God. Our God who is sovereign over all details. He's in control of all things. He was in control of the planning of this massacre. And so now that the date was determined, it was time for Haman to get the king on board. And as we're going to see, it wasn't very hard for Haman to convince the king. Let's pick up in verse 8, and then we're going to read until verse 11. It says, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. 
so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it to the king's treasuries. So the king took off his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So what happens here, Haman, he, he sort of comes up with this plan of how he's going to share this plot with the king. And what he's doing here is he's giving this entirely bogus scenario that's full of general statements. Haman says there's these certain people, so the king has absolutely no idea who these people were. He says that they do not keep the king's laws, but Haman doesn't provide any sort of specifics as to what laws they're breaking. All that he does is say, these people, it would be in the king's profit not to tolerate them. It would be in the king's interest if he were to wipe them out. All that Haman is focusing on is manipulating the king into getting what he wants. Remember, he wants to satisfy his wrath, all starting with Mordecai's refusal not to bow down to him. And so he wants to see his plan set in motion. And you know, it's no different than what many of us can be guilty of. You know, I'm not saying that we're all going to devise this plot of, of killing a bunch of people. I sure hope not. But what I'm saying here is that oftentimes we may leave out the details in a story that we know may be detrimental if we were to share them, all so that we can get our desired outcome. And so that's what Haman is doing in this example. And he tops it off with sort of a bribe. He offers to pay 10,000 talents of silver, which in today's value would be millions of dollars. And this isn't money that Haman had in his pocket or back in his home, but this is money that he was expecting to receive from killing the Jews and then taking hold of their property and possessions. And without having to think twice, the king, he takes off his signet ring, he hands it over to Haman, almost as if he's signing off on this decree. It's a piece of cake. Haman probably didn't break a sweat in even having to share this with the king. So what does this tell us about the king? Well, first and foremost, it says he could care less about the value of human life. I mean, the king has no idea who these people are, he has no idea what exactly they have done. All he cares about is if these people come off as a threat to him. Either he's super trusting in Haman as his second in command, or he just really doesn't care about the value of human life. Probably both. It would have been entirely a different story if he knew that his very queen was a part of the people that were going to be impacted by this decree, for Esther was a Jew. So just to give you all an idea of, of how many people, how many Jews this decree would impact, I want you guys to look at this map. Uh, it's a map of the Persian Empire that was at the time of Esther. And remember, this story is set after the Babylonian exile, when Persia had replaced Babylon as the ruling power. After this, some Jews, they returned home to Jerusalem while others remained in exile, like Mordecai and Esther. And this map, it gives you an idea of how vast the Persian Empire was. They had controlled all of these lands that are within the red border. As you can see, that includes Jerusalem, Samaria, Judah. And so, if Haman's plot actually happened, his plan to exterminate all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire... It would have annihilated virtually all of the Jewish people. If this evil plan came to fruition, all of God's people, the line in which the Messiah was to come, would be wiped out. And can you imagine what the Jews must have been thinking when they caught news of this decree? 
asking God, wait, what's happened? I mean, you just delivered us from exile, and, and, and now we've, we've kind of been Roman free and still under Persian rule, but now you want to wipe us out? Have you abandoned us? Are, are we not your chosen people anymore? See, this is the sort of tension that we're left with in the story. Let's finish up the remainder of the passage, starting in verse 12. It says, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month. And an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of the king Ahasuerus, sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. So the decree has approval by the king, and immediately following, it goes out to all the people in the Persian Empire. And if you remember the map, it, it's going to take some time for everyone to catch news of this decree. And I want us to notice there's two different responses that are taking place here after this decree has been sent out. The first is we see the king and Haman sort of celebrating with a drink. I mean, it's pretty messed up if you think about it. They sign off on this decree of, of a mass murder, and then they top it off with a drink. Like, all right, good for us. We did it. But at the end of verse 15, it says, The city of Susa was thrown into confusion. This tells us there's some reassuring evidence that Susa's citizens... They didn't share Haman's same hatred toward the Jews. They were actually wondering, most likely, man, why is there such a harsh decree that's been given? What did the Jews do to deserve such a punishment? And I'm sure that this decree, it also had to have felt like a threat to other minority groups. Thinking, wow, if, if the king is, is going to wipe out all the Jews, are we next? What, what's stopping the king from killing us next? You know, altogether, this chapter in Esther seems pretty discouraging, if we're being honest, when we're just reading it on the surface. I mean, think of all that's happened. So Haman was promoted by the king, even though Mordecai was more deserving. Mordecai's refusal, his, his stance of boldness and his stance of faith, I mean, it wasn't received very well. It actually led to Haman's rage and anger, which then led to this decree of killing Mordecai and all of his people with the king's permission. Again, God was completely in control of this series of events, right? But remember the decision that led to Haman's plot against the Jews? It was Mordecai's refusal to bow. Mordecai made a stance of boldness. He made a stance for his faith, even though he was the only one who was standing. I'm sure he felt fearful of what those consequences may have been, but in that moment, he chose faith. And there's several other examples in Scripture of those who also chose faith over fear. I think of Daniel. Daniel, who knew the consequences of praying to God, but still, he chose to remain faithful. He went against King Darius' decree, and as a result, he was thrown into the lion's den. But still, God delivered him. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who knew that their lives were on the line when they made the decision not to bow down to any idols. And in response, King Nebuchadnezzar, they threw these men into the fiery furnace, sort of like a death sentence. But still, God delivered them. We read about these examples in Scripture where these men make a stance of boldness in their faith, yet God honors their decision. And 
when we read about these examples too, it actually makes us wonder in our own lives, man, would I be as bold as Daniel, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as Mordecai, if I were to be put in a situation of making a stance for Jesus? I want to end as we wrap up our time with sharing a story. Um, Two years ago, my wife Hannah and I, we graduated from Biola, and just two days after that, we got married. It was a pretty crazy weekend. Uh, And then a week later, we picked up all of our things, and we moved to the Bay Area. We moved to Marin County. And once we moved, we both started new jobs. So I stepped in as a youth pastor, actually at the church that I was raised in, and Hannah stepped in as an FCA representative. And so maybe some of you have heard of FCA before. It stands for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And her uh, main goal was to minister to students and to athletes through a club that meets on school campuses, a club where they can be able to share the gospel with some of, some of those who may have never heard it before. But you see, there was an initial challenge with her job. In the area where we moved, there were no pre-existing FCA clubs. To give some perspective, down here in Southern California, FCA is almost like a household name. I mean, FCA is spread throughout many campuses across Southern California, Orange County, L.A. County. But if you were to bring up FCA to anyone in Marin, or even throughout the Bay Area for that matter, no one would know what you're talking about. And to give more context about Marin County, it's the most unchurched area in the nation. There are a very few number of churches in Marin, and even fewer number of those churches who are actually preaching from God's word. So to say that this was a challenge um, it might even be an understatement. We knew what we were getting ourselves into. Hannah needed to find students and a club advisor to be a part of something that was bound to spark controversy. So a few months into Hannah's job, she found a student. Uh, her name was Clarice, and Clarice said that she was willing to serve as the FCA club president, a big undertaking. As the school year began, Clarice submitted a club request form uh, to the school. And just a few days later, she got called into the vice principal's office, which, mind you, that's never a good sign. And so Clarice, she's called into the vice principal's office, and she sits down, and the vice principal tells her, Clarice, you can't start an FCA club because it's a Christian club. It's way too exclusive. That would never be able to be a part of our school campus. And so you think at this point of the story, many of us, if we were in Clarice's shoes, would say, all right, I hear you. Get up, walk out, and almost pretend like nothing happened. You know, it's way easier to do that, at least. But as believers, we must take a stance for what is right, without being timid and and without being held back by fear, and still... Respect should never be compromised in our pursuit of justice. So after being told that they could not bring an FCA club onto campus, Clarice and Hannah, they met together and they formed this sort of document, think of it as like a school bill of rights, that shared their rights. Their rights of starting a Christian club, their rights of bringing Bibles onto campus, and their rights to share the gospel freely. These are all rights that we have, but rights that not many of us know. And so they put this document together, they brought it to the vice principal, and the vice principal, she responded and said, I guess you're right. (laughs) I can't deny your rights. I I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And so she allowed the club to start on campus. All of this all started with one student's step of boldness in their faith. And God honored her decision. And if I even look back on the impact that this club made on the students who were a part of it, on the leadership team and the students who were coming and showing up, at one point there were over 50 kids who were a part of this club, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, many of whom actually surrendered their lives to Jesus. This all started with one girl's decision to be bold in her faith. You know, when you're following Christ... It makes you realize that even if you lose everything in this life, which to us it might seem like our status, our popularity, um, friendships, respect, 
even if you lose all of those things for making a stance in your faith, you still have everything. Because all these things that we may put at a high pedestal in our lives, they're temporary. What's forever, what's eternal is our relationship with Christ and his presence with us. And when we cultivate this perspective in our life, it helps to give less meaning and value to the things of this world, our present circumstances and our fears that may go along with that. In response, we can go forward in our faith, have peace with Jesus, knowing that he is with us. Jesus, the one who goes before us, the one who stands beside us, and the one who lives in us. Isaiah 41.10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Without Jesus, well, we have many reasons to fear in this life. I mean, think of all that our world has come to. This pandemic, think of politics, famine, natural disasters. We have so many reasons to fear if it wasn't for Jesus. But with him, we have no reason to fear. As it says in Isaiah, he will strengthen you, he will help you, and he will uphold you. So church, let's make a stance for Jesus, right? Let's make a stance for Jesus, whether it be big or small, whether we're alone or with a group of other people. Let's make a stance of boldness in our faith in Christ. And see that God's going to honor that decision. It may not be in an outcome that we desire, that we have planned for, but it will ultimately be to fulfill his greater plan, a plan that is much better than any of us can ever imagine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning to be able to read in your word, to be encouraged by what it has to say. Father, I thank you that even when our circumstances may seem bleak that you are with us. Father, I pray that we would just be so filled with you, Lord, that whenever fears come our way, we wouldn't be shaken. God, that we would trust in your faithfulness for us. So God, we thank you for this time. May this message serve as an encouragement, but also conviction to those who are able to hear it. In your son's name we pray. Amen.